Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake, and I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. And today we are on the South Terrace of the Education Center at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum uh, for obvious reasons. We've got a Prunus Mume bridal veil right here that is blooming its little head off right now. Today is what, January 21st? It's it's a little early for Prunus Mume, not too early. This is about the time of year that they do it, but we are very grateful for this tree. It smells amazing. It smells as amazing as it looks. But today, as you may have just seen as we panned out, we have a garden conversation. Today we have Barb Fair with us, who is an associate professor at NC State University. She teaches arboriculture and landscape maintenance design. No. Or design. Design. Can't design my way out of a Can't box. design out of a wet paper bag. Okay, <laughs> well, that's, that's fine. That. She has other skills, <laughs> other interests in horticulture. And we've got our director of horticulture, Greg Page, here, who's going to be having a nice little conversation with Barb about any and everything that comes to their mind. So that should be a wonderful program. <laughs> Those of you who are watching this program on YouTube, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel and feel free to leave a comment in the comments down below. And with the announcements out of the way, I think we can pass things over to Greg to lead us through this conversation with Barb. Thank you, Blake. That was a lot of announcements. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on. It, uh, it never seems to, to end. And for those of you that think that there's a downtime in horticulture, that, that does not exist anymore. Um, there, there's never a, uh, an ounce of it here. Um, as, as he alluded, we have a, a different guest today. And um, I have been very lucky to know Barb for quite a long time. I met her at my previous job at Bartlett um, through a, a joint friend of ours and colleague of mine, Tom Smiley, um, quite a long time ago. Um, I think you brought a class down to visit and you popped in, uh, I, w I don't wanna say frequently, but quite a bit um, <laughs> to, to visit. And we've crossed paths doing talks and things. And when I was trying to, to get my head around who we could, could get, um, I am lucky to drive by some of Barb's research every day. She's got a nice pile of, of root flares and that <laughs> scratches an itch for me to see those things all um, ex excavated out where you can see the whole masses of those roots. It's such a great teaching thing. And the light bulb went off, um, which doesn't happen every day, but it happened this morning. And uh, Blake beat me to it. We powwow, we got it together. And, and here she is like magic. Um, I, I, again, appreciate you, you filling in and, and jumping in for us. But what, what I, um, part of my evil plan as, as I've done these things is to reach out to the public horticulture community here that is so rich and diverse and bring those people to the garden so that you can meet them this way, um, people that I think a lot of. And also, um, as uh, I, I come upon being here for a full year now um, and, and slowly meeting and, and working with a lot of folks at NC State, um, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to be a part of that big community and getting those people here to, so this is a, this is a double whammy. This is somebody I've known as a friend for a long time and a colleague in the, in the um, urban uh, tree world and also uh, a partner in NC State. So welcome with, with all that. Thank you. I'm, I'm very, very glad to have you here. What I thought we'd talk about, and uh, we're not gonna stick to anything uh, strict as we, as we do here, but um, also to get a jump on, um, uh, we're gonna do a celebrating women in, in horticulture in March. So um, Barb is kicking that off for us officially here and um, would love to talk to you about why you got started in this field, what kind of made you go in, in, the, in the, the realm of working with plants and people and teaching and outreach, um, your path to get there, and um, maybe some of, the, some of the things that we find interesting in our boriculture tree care, um, you know, uh, root growth and all that stuff. We talked about Bryce's soil class. You know, when I, when I went through college many, many years ago, you know, tree care was standing at a tree looking up. And so much of that is now what's going on below the ground. Um, little, little did we know back in the day. So that gives us some, some, uh, some fuel for, for things to bite on. So um, within the next hour, um, that's a lot of stuff to cover. How did you get into into this field? What what drove you in, in this direction of madness? I, you know, when I was young, I loved being outdoors. I loved trees from very young age, 
And I didn't know about horticulture. Like they didn't really talk about that yeah. when I was, you know, getting advice at high school, what uh, career I should get into. And being from Pennsylvania, of course, Penn State, uh, a well uh, noted forestry school. Yep. I went to a branch campus called Mont Alto. Oh, and of course yeah. they called it the country club, but two year students and, and forestry students could go there and uh, study in an amazingly beautiful place. Not that main campus isn't beautiful, but it's a small, it really still is. intimate, beautiful it still campus. Is. My son actually went there. That's how old I am. Uh, but <clears throat> so, you know, I studied forestry for four years and, and I minored in wildlife management and thought, I can go out there and get a job. Well, life does what life does, that's, right? That's and I, sure. I, I've been around. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in Minnesota for a little while on um, a Native American uh, community. And wow. that was pretty cool. And we did some forestry there, some traditional forestry. Uh, but uh, it was too cold, as you might imagine. It Oof. snows like from October till May. And not a lot of sunshine. A, either. No. And then you have a lot of flies that are trying to get up your nose and all the other parts of your body. Yeah. So that's the, that's, you know, a kind of cool thing. But it was so, I mean, again, really a beautiful place to live, but not not where you could get a lot of opportunity job wise. No. But I ended up having a child. Uh, and so that kind of changed course of things. But I started kind of looking at how how can I integrate more of the people into forestry? Because I love the trees but I also love people mm -hmm. and wanted to work with people more. And that's when uh, urban forestry really started to get going. Yep. And of course, back then they called it the redheaded stepchild, right? Yes. Nobody understood urban forestry. So people would say, well, isn't that an oxymoron? Yeah. And I would challenge any of you, you go up in a plane and you look down on a city as you're flying, that's an urban forest, right? Yep. It, it is very clear to me what, you, what you're looking at. And so uh, got a job as a city forester and that meant tree climbing. That meant wielding a very large chainsaw. Uh, <laughs> learning how to climb was like learning how to fly. And I loved it. It was so much fun, even with a chainsaw up in the yeah, tree. And you know yeah. that that's work. It's, it's hard work. It's, it's young hard, people work. It's hard work, right. Yes. Um, and so ended up you know, with a couple of different places, got a master's degree, uh, and then went to work in Ohio as, a, as an extension urban forester there and served 15 counties. And met a professor at Ohio State that said, why don't you come and study with me? Because I love teaching. I had kind of a natural knack for it. And so I went back for my PhD in urban forestry there, essentially. But it was in the horticulture department. Um, and so that kind of just led to a job in eastern Kentucky for a couple of years. Uh, and then NC State. And NC State, I've... Uh, I felt very much at home here. I felt like there was a great opportunity. Uh, in our department, right, and even in forestry, there, there wasn't really an urban forestry program. There was nobody teaching arbor culture. So it is sort of a special niche for me. Mm -hmm. there, is an urban, there are some urban forestry folks in, in there, but they're kind of more at the 40, 50,000 you know, foot level. <laughs> they're not doing, they, they don't, like we get a lot of the calls from them or yeah. the emails that say, hey, hey, Barb, can you handle this tree question? Because yeah. it would be specific to, well, how do I prune this? What's wrong with my tree? And so on. So, uh, you know, we... We were sad to see that even that focus go away mm -hmm. from natural resources. So I tried to pick up what I could teaching herb, arbor culture and urban forestry. But as Greg alluded to, it is not an easy field. Um, we try to encourage students to take it. We, we wanted them to take it because guess what? You get to climb. It's like rock climbing. right? How much fun could this be? And they're like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so sadly, I taught that for a little while, but just didn't get enough students. Yeah. Uh, but what's cool, and this is really cool that this is perfect timing. Yeah. Um, natural Resources is looking to bring back the focus in urban forestry. Because if you, you guys know, and I'm sure you've heard this uh, countless times, especially if you talk about stormwater, right? You get Mitch Woodward, he'll talk about stormwater yep. all day, right? Um, we're developing constantly, right? You look out your door and you see destruction of green space. And so a lot of, of issues with how can we use vegetation 
to help mitigate some of this development, right? And so Natural Resources is looking to bring back that focus. That's great. And they've reached out to me uh, and the department to say, you know, how can we partner to make this happen? So keep a watch on that. I'm really hopeful that we can bring some things back and get some classes going. Um, but it's, you're right, it's a young person thing. When it, it I is. teach climbing, I bring in my friends from Bartlett because <laughs> one of them was my student, so it's only fair, right? Uh, he was in my uh, Trees and Grounds class many years ago, Travis Black, as you oh, know. Yeah. And he and I are good friends and colleagues now. And, and Travis was one of those few that just fell in love with trees. And he was a design student. And he said, yeah, I like trees a lot better. Uh, so he went out and worked at Bartlett, came back for a master's and then went uh, back to Bartlett uh, after that a little bit. So where he works now and I make him come every year <laughs> and teach my students how to climb. Because uh, of course safety is key. Very and much, I can't tie a knot now so. to save my life, probably. I, it's and, uh, it's yeah. muscle memory. When you stop doing that stuff, you you forget those you do. crucial, important things. Really easily, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, um, it, when I was in Ohio, I was one of the first women to become a certified arborist way back in 1991. That's how old I am. But uh, things were very different there. And uh, it is a really great field for women. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more women climbers now. Um, and a lot more women in urban forestry. And that's a really nice fit for, for a lot of us because, mm -hmm. you know, we, women are a little different than men. You know, we tend to be very social <laughs> and that fits perfectly uh, for a lot of women. So it is a really great opportunity for young women to get involved. And it's, it's, uh, in it's, it's, it's such a urban, urban forestry, managing urban trees is such a, you know, it, it continues to grow and develop for lots of reasons. More and more people are in urban areas. Um, just the connection between things like you said, managing stormwater, um, shade for, for climate change and, 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 and fixing heat island stuff. But we interact with trees a lot and places where trees are, people are, you know, there's all kinds of research. We've talked about this before, reductions in crime and poverty and all those things and an increase in community and correctly managing trees because they don't have voices. They don't tell you when something's going wrong with them. And when they have problems, the easiest way to fix them is to cut them down and not to go back and do something. Right. So having, you know, if it's, if it's something that is of interest to people, it's a great opportunity, um, you know, but learning those things, the, the basics, uh, you know, the climbing and pruning and all those things is super important you can move into some of those more, more management sides of, of things. And it, it, there's a lot of diversity in that field now where there didn't used to be any. Yeah. Um, it was very much a good old boy thing. And lots of, I always tell people um, when I worked for a, the, in the tree care world, you know, what's it like? It's like, there's a lot of testosterone <laughs> all, all the time. And that's not necessarily a good thing, um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of more, there's more room for, for that. Um, it's a, it's a great opportunity to do a, a lot of good. And, um, you know, I'm meeting with somebody this uh, Friday um, with a city that does a lot of stuff with, uh, uh, I think he's a city horticulturalist, mm -hmm. but he taps into some of that stuff as well. Um, but that's great that it's coming back. It's, right. I'm super excited about the opportunity there. And uh, like Greg's saying, there are so many different avenues you can go. You don't have to climb trees if you don't want to. You don't have to get your feet off the ground. You certainly need to understand trees and how they grow, but understanding that relationship with people and trees is really the important part for urban yep. forestry. And, and I will dare say that if we don't think about this more, think about how we're doing our development, where we are carte blanche taking down trees, it, it is very different to have 50, you know, 60 foot tall trees versus a bunch of brand new planted trees. Now, mm -hmm. obviously we want to plant trees, but you're taking away a very established situation. And I think we're doing that at our, at, at our peril. It's uh, not, the, it's the not a sustainable that we do it. It is not, it's sustainable. not a sustainable rate. And, and you're not going to be able to live in a community without, without green space, without trees. And no. I don't think people always put that together. And I, I'm, I'm coming from a unique, unique situation where living in, Sh in Charlotte, which is growing at a faster pace than Raleigh, and they have a very good, um, the city has a good 
group of people that maintain the tree canopy. They've got a um, Tree Charlotte, a good foundation that's mm -hmm. linked to that. That's good at educating and getting people involved in planting and making sure that that's at the forefront of things but they can't keep up with the pace of the development and a number of things that get removed and not having good quality tree care in place for new things that are that are going in <clears throat> and coming to Raleigh, you know, the city of Oaks, um, <laughs> that is, that's a real thing. I mean, there's thing. a lot of diversity here, which is very important and we can talk about that. Um, it's not all one species of oak and one species of maple and one species of a flowering tree. There's a lot of diversity scattered all through the city and a lot of dedication to greenway and green space and park space where, uh, you know, not to throw shade at, at Charlotte, no pun intended, but they're really not looking at that from a long-term standpoint. Um, you know, I, I think about all the things that are, you know, uh, the art museum and all the, the Greenway stuff that's here. And uh, there's so much of that here in Raleigh. We're very lucky to, to have that. It's an important uh, part of those things kind of all linking together and, and solving solving some of those some of those problems. Um, on that note of, of, of diversity, uh, you mentioned doing tr uh, plant ID. Uh, yeah, there that's, that's new. We're talking. Um, Brian Jackson has been the ID teacher for a number of years mm -hmm. and absolutely loves it. He's interested in going on to some different challenges. He's very interested in creating a class in um, soilless media, mm -hmm. which would be absolutely unique across all of the university systems in, 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 this, in the country. And so that would uniquely position us. And so that's a pretty cool idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're teaching the same class over and over again <laughs> uh, for many years, you get tired. And yes. I, I love the material, but I'm ready for a change. I'm probably, you know, I'm looking at retirement maybe in the next, you know, 20, three 30, to five 40, years. No, 30. no, no, no. Yeah, sooner than, yeah, sooner than Greg thinks. Uh, but... So I, I'm interested in a new challenge, and so he and I talked about that. Of course, you guys that might know me know my primary job is extension, and that's where I get to share my expertise. Like, I was coming here today from Ashboro, where I was just a part of the North Carolina Urban Forest Council board meeting, and where I'm an ex-officio member, but I'm a very active ex-officio member. Not like you probably don't know that I like to talk. So, yeah, uh, and have a thought or two about things. And so we, um, you know, that's, it's a really important organization to me and they do a lot of education and Tree Charlotte, actually there's a, the, the executive director that is, sits on our board. So that's yeah. pretty cool. So, you know, we've just hired a new executive director, which oh, wow. is great. Our longtime executive director left to be a forester in Cary. So they're very lucky. Mm. Uh, and yeah, Leslie Mormon is there. She is awesome and they're really lucky, but uh, we had to find somebody else, so we're excited about that change. But yeah, so may, uh, if we can make it work, uh, you know, we've had uh, Dr. Krause is retiring mm -hmm. and Ann Spafford uh, got a new job. And so this is huge change for our department, but a great opportunity to start talking about what, how might we refine some classes? How might we change things? And so I'm excited about taking on the ID courses looking at it as functional groups mm -hmm. rather than just teaching lists of plant material because they both classes include woodies as well as herbaceous plants. So how can we combine those? So prime example, stormwater mm -hmm. and green infrastructure. What kind of plants can you use for that? So looking at a module of here's some plants that we can use for these different functions because that to me is the most important thing. Any design should be pretty, right? Yeah. To me, that's the bottom, but wrong. It should be pretty. Now we all might differ about what we think is pretty, but the functionality should be what should we're be, really that should thinking be at the about. Top. At the top, how do we design and and install and maintain landscapes that are truly multifunctional? And it's there. We can do it. We just have that's to look really, at it differently. That's a really good angle because I think you know, looking back at when I took ID classes in college. Um, I've got a curator brain, so I can remember plant names relatively <laughs> sure. easy, and I can associate, I can see it once, and I can associate things. But by doing groups of things, 
I think not only is that going to increase their palate, it's going to help them remember things better. Uh -huh. they're going to associate those, that's going to help them associate them with each other and other things. And it's going to, it's going to stick to, that's a really sharp angle yeah. uh, to think of it, to think of it that way. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Kind of fun. Yeah. Well, and you know, just to kind of weave off of that and go into what you were talking about with Bryce coming to talk about yeah. soil, right? And you yeah. looked at my roots. Yes. And uh, I'll just share quick that study. Uh, and you mentioned the art museum. Uh, I'll also mention Southwest Airport, yep. uh, new terminal they built a few years ago. One of the things that we look at is soil, mm -hmm. of course. And a lot of folks are, and this goes to the development issue and everything too, right? Uh, everybody thinks we'll tear off the soil and then we'll put it back and we'll make it better than nature did, right? And I always think, really? Because we haven't shown that we can do much better than nature as so far as I can tell Not so yet. far. But so uh, they are using a, what I call this kind of designer mix, this soil mix that has about 30% by volume organic matter in it. And intuitively, I think that's too much. If you look at nature, you're talking 5%, you yeah. know, maybe five to 10%. And so the soil scientists I'm looking at and their research says 20% max. Yeah. And so I put a study in here out in our research lab, right adjacent to the Arboretum, a couple different species of trees, but the one treatment was just the standard old stuff we used to always do, right? Put a couple of inches of compost over the top, till it in nine inches, plant your stuff and you're on, on, on your way. And the other was digging out all the soil and putting in this designer soil. And the trees for the most part did not like the designer soil. And if Greg's looking at these roots and if you look very closely, what you'll see is happening is and this is my theory, I still have to collect all that data. You know, harvesting 40 trees and getting 40 root systems That's out of easy. the ground. That doesn't no, take any time. No problem, right? It's easy. <laughs> yeah, I was so excited though when the guys from the uh, from the field lab were able to just dig a, pop them out of the ground with the skid steer. I was yeah. so surprised and so happy. Yeah. Uh, but now you have to process those. But what anybody noticed that looked at them said, man, these that were growing in the designer soil have far less fibrous roots than the ones that were growing in the more traditional kind of amendment management practice. And my theory is it gets really wet when it's wet, right? Because that compost, once it's wet, it holds moisture really well, mm -hmm. right? And you'll learn all this when you listen to Bryce, you know, starting on Monday. And so it kills those fibrous roots, right? And then it goes, then as it's drying out, the roots regrow until it gets way too dry. So if you're not going to irrigate, and to me, irrigation of established landscapes is not always sustainable, right? So those roots die again. So what happens is you get that cycle of, you know, growth and death. It steals all that energy from the tree. And so it affects the ability of that root system to mine that area. And the fibrous roots are the most important, mm -hmm. as we know, taking up nutrients and water. And so that's, that's my theory of and what's happening. all the happening. stress of that. Causes exactly, and then through, the trees, yeah. you know, above ground were not were were smaller. The leaves, the leaves were smaller. Yeah. And there was less biomass. Yeah. So, you know, it's I'm super excited to get that finished. Yep. Um, and I, I luckily have a student that's helping me hard, but you know, kind of look at those roots. And so we'll be looking at fibrous roots versus big roots, right? Yeah. So, it's so much fun to do tree research, except it takes a really long time, as you can imagine. <laughs> that's that. <laughs> Yeah, trees trees don't cooperate, and then there's that. You know, they don't cooperate the way that you would like them to, and the weather doesn't, and all that no. that entails. But yeah, it's it, you, anybody that works with trees, and my wife always tells me this, and I think it's why we've been together so long. Is if you work with plants, you have a lot of patience. You do because you have to. <laughs> you have to endure all those things and the time it takes to do that. But um, I'm thinking about the roots. You know, um, um, uh, remembrance. You know. I have assimilated lots of knowledge by being around really smart tree people in my life. <laughs> I've been too. very lucky, Tom Smiley and Bruce Frederick. Oh yeah, they did God. a lot of great work. But you know, one of the things that, that we, and Kelby, um, one of the things that we noticed, Kelby Fight, um, in, in the research we did with Air Spade, mm -hmm. and it kind of relates to what you're saying, is we noticed that, you know, we, we would air spade, we'd, we'd reduce compaction. Um, Kelby always used to say, if you build it, they will come. If you, mm -hmm. if you, if you make the soil um, less compact um, and have organic matter, but not too much, right. the roots are gonna come. Yep. So we would air spade, we would do all that stuff. 
and you wouldn't see, you'd think you'd see a lot more fibrous roots and it took time for that. But what they found out is they were more, the roots that came out were more productive because they had all those good kind of growing conditions going mm -hmm. on. Yep. But, you know, the, the organic matter, you know, all things in moderation. Yep. It's too much of a good thing is too much of a good thing. And it's great to add that. And this is something that we tell people. And again, Bryce is going to talk about this better than I can. Um, you know, you're getting a lot of organic matter when you're when you're planting trees. If you use the existing soil, maybe add a little bit. But when you're mulching and that's something we can talk about mm -hmm. is that mulch um, adds so much as it's breaking down three to four inches. What what are some of the things, um, you know, from, from your perspective, the research you've done and your years of working that you could tell us about mulching in general? Right, and so I, <laughs> my students love this. Um, mulch to me is the underwear of the landscape. <laughs> That's great. You know, some people might <laughs> wear it or not, or right. bigger or boxers, boxers or briefs, or briefs or however you, you wanna go with it, yeah. right? But what doesn't mean we need to see it, right? right? Um, some people share it more than others, and yep. that's fine. But yep. my theory, my, my point behind that is, you, you know, you'll see seas of mulch. And here's a tree, here's a tree, here's a tree. Where is the ecosystem then? Yeah. And you talk, we talked about biodiversity a little bit yeah. um, before we started. And, and uh, we were talking about biodiversity at our meeting today. You know, people were interested in that. And what does biodiversity mean and for what? Uh, wildlife, you know, whatever it might be, we're thinking about that. And I think we need to add plants. Mulch is really important, but having plants as part of that. So you yeah. have all the layers. Yep. And if you're interested in wildlife, you know, you ever hear Chris, Dr. Chris Mormon talk about it. The layering is really important because if you like birds, you attract different kinds of birds, mm -hmm. right? They all hang out in different zones. Yep. And so having those trees, but having then, you know, shrubs of different heights, and then that vegetation layer, that ground cover, the herbaceous plants, and still you can have mulch. Right. And um, the problem is, is we use bark. Right. Yeah. And that's yep. the easiest thing. That's what we've always used. You know, so many countries, which I'm sure you've been to places, they don't even use. They've no. never heard of mulch. What is this mulch business? Right. No. And so to me, the best mulch is what you guys use here. Right. Yeah. Leaf compost. Yep. Uh, where you can also do leaf compost with wood chips where you're mixing them together. And because you have something that acts much uh, quickly, it breaks down more quickly than you have the wood chips that break down over a longer period of time. And, you know, people worry about fresh wood chips. Uh, don't worry about that. They, they, don't, they don't cause any nutrient deficiencies for plants, uh, not maybe in a very, very tiny short uh, period. But as soon as those microorganisms start breaking down that mulch, it's quick. It's quick. They're, you know, breaking down those wood chips, they're available to plants right away. So I, it's, mulch is an important tool. Let's use it correctly. Let's not overuse it. Let's not do it uh, improperly, which we normally see, right? You see guys shoveling that mulch out, out there on top of all the, the little ground cover plants. It's like, no, thank you. Uh, or you know, everybody thinks of the volcano mulch. I do, I do still see some of that, not as much as I used to. Yeah. What I am seeing are people planting things too high, yeah. right? Or and, too deep. Yeah, and how do I find that out? Because I get out of my car and I start digging, right? And you know, I'm seeing trees sometimes a foot above grade. And so you imagine that, then you imagine triple shredded hardwood bark mulch on there, which is hydrophobic. Where does all the water go? And in time of a drought, you have a plant that's even more stressed now because or it the, hasn't been planted Or correctly. you get a period of moisture, the nice moist organic exactly. matter, it shoots roots out into that horizon, yep. and then it dries out and that, that whole secondary root system is gonna die and cause stress up mm -hmm. the tree and start that whole that whole whole chain of events. Yep. Yeah. So mulch is easy, but not. Yeah. I mean, most people just don't do it correctly. It's the simplest the thing to kind of at do good for a plant mm -hmm. and it's the second easiest way to really hurt a plant <laughs> especially um, herbaceous perennials yes yeah. yes and and trees is yeah. you know over the the first is is planting mm -hmm. um so you talked about planting too high and i think the reason that's done is it's too hard to dig a hole because the so there's no soil mm -hmm. and it's easier just to dump a bunch of medium on top halfway up to the the, the roof i was in a shopping center um uh, last week and was like looking at, I did the same thing you did. I forget where it was, but it was like, those trees are three feet out of the ground. Yep. And they were big, uh, they were B&B &B red maples. Mm -hmm. um, not the best tree for a parking lot island nope. for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but you know, it's just, 
I think about how much that tree cost, how much it costs somebody to, to plant it and they're putting mulch on it and it's gonna be dead in less than 10 years and they're gonna rip it out and do the process all over again. It's, it's job security, <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, I've been preaching from that soapbox for 30 years and, mm -hmm. and, and, and you have too. And we're still doing it. Yeah. We're still doing it. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about planting too deep, which I think that's, okay. the, that's the first and fastest way to kill any plant mm -hmm. is, is to do that. Um, you know, and, and it ties into, again, to your soil and what's going on underneath, underneath the ground. What, what have you seen are, are the detriments of that? Sure. And, you know, you have the challenges and, and it's getting better in the nursery industry where Absolutely. they're growing things better. Uh, in the past, you'd see nurseries that maybe didn't want to stake their trees when they lined them out in the fields. And so they'd, they'd instead of putting a bamboo stake on there, they'd shove that liner down, you know, a good six inches below the soil line where that first main order root is, mm -hmm. is a good way to in that. And so, you know, if you, I have a planting video on uh, the NC State Extension website, or if you just Google me, you'll find a great video on planting and how you determine how to put that depth. So if you buy a tree from a nursery that's planted too deep, you're not getting the right size ball, right? Because you have the uh, ANSI standards for nursery production. Yep. And so that ball is gonna be too small. But the key then is figuring out where those roots are so you can plant it at the right depth because those should be right at grade, right? And um, when I see them too deep, they're typically too deep in the root ball, then too deep in the landscape as yep. well. And yep. so it's like a double whammy. Yep. And they, you will end up, because you're gonna form potentially adventitious roots on that trunk down there. But like Greg was saying, adventitious roots that can't really be easily supported because they're, they're in that zone that dries out or is too wet or dries out and too wet. And that fluctuation is what really steals energy from trees, essentially, mm -hmm. you could say. So, yeah, you know, and it, some of it's so easy to solve. If you, if you, if, if we could work with engineers, work with, you know, city folks, landscape architects, you know, arbor culture people and urban forestry people working together to say, you know, we want to keep soil on site. Yeah. We, we want to stop taking it elsewhere because we aren't doing better than mother nature, as I said. Mm -hmm. Leave that topsoil there because number one, that's less expensive than hauling it off. I understand you can sell it down the road, but I mean, there's a perfect site and, and I don't want to you know be mean to anybody, but Pullen Road. <laughs> yes. There are a lot of dying willow oak there and willow oak is a very tough tree. It's, it's because they have tough. no topsoil. Yeah. So all of the phosphorus has been tied up in that subsoil. And so, uh, cause I have, uh, I know the contractor that planted those trees and their company is excellent, but there was no spec for leaving topsoil or even adding topsoil back or, or organic matter. Yeah. And when you learn from Bryce, you'll find out how important that is. And that's to me, such a missed opportunity and why? Yeah. You know, and you were talking about these big, you know, you go to White Oak Shopping Center down where I live in Garner and they have the huge medians in the parking areas, right? That are like, you know, six or eight feet high. And it's like, well, no wonder all the water's running off of there. Why can't we make them green infrastructure things, right? Why can't we make them shallow and plant vegetation and trees in there and let the yeah. water, I don't know. Yeah. Like if somebody decided if you crash into there, it's gonna, <laughs> I don't know. It works because I've seen it in other cities and other places. So. In other parts of the world. Where yes. they, they do that. Yeah, it, A lot of it is aesthetics and a lot of it is pe most people just don't know right and they want to see what they saw at the other shopping center or, sure. in their, or the other <laughs> sure. neighborhood or where they used to live before they moved down here or or whatnot and and this is something that when annabelle comes that we'll talk about one of the things they're looking at in in parking lots is you know why doom a tree to death that's not going to live in that horizon the wrong plant in the right place right let's turn these into you know, like little meadows or little prairies mm -hmm. that have multiple season of interest, things for insects to attract to, and don't require a lot of maintenance. There's no such thing as a no maintenance, but that's, that's something right. you can do. But to a lot of people, that aesthetic, you know, I'm gonna throw my wife under the bus. The first time I took her to Duke Gardens to see the prairie, um, you know, and I just spent the afternoon with, with the folks there and I was just so enamored with it and full of ideas to take back and do in Charlotte. And I was pointing all the plants out and the layers and the, the movements and <laughs> the season of interest. And she's patting me. She's like, I know you like it, but it looks like a bunch of weeds to me. 
<laughs> and, and, that, and that's sure. exactly it. Sure. And, and you know, people cut through them because they can't walk around it to get to their car and you can't right. walk through stuff that's as high. So right. it's, you know, there's, there's gotta be a better way to get, you know, to get the message across and to do that. And I think here, because of NC State, the stuff that you're doing, um, the wealth of other gardens here, the things that we do, I think there's a, you know, there's a there's a better opportunity, and and I'm going to devote, I'm going to continue to devote energy and and talk till I can't talk anymore to to, <laughs> to get people to to kind of embrace that. Well, nature is messy. Nature is nature messy. Nature is not tidy, and that no. we need to mimic better. Yeah. 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 Well, a lot of people don't want to get messy, though. No, they um, don't. They, 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 <laughs> I understand they, that. They, they, they can't. They can't do it. Um, that's a good segue into into pruning. Ah. Um, <laughs> again, I've been lucky to work with some amazing people that were so much better at teaching it than me. I understand it. I get it. I know how to do it. I know. I'm, I've seen your work. <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm terrible at, at at explaining it to people, and I'm not asking you to do that now. But what are I think some that's true. what are but. some what are some basic things that you could you could you could tell people, you know, aside from the things that we always tell people is, you know, use the right, right tools to do it with mm -hmm. um, and timing and, and those sorts of things. What are what are some hot button things that that you would convey to to the world on, on, on that? You know, I don't you know, you you mentioned 40 years. We've both been in this industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm probably much older than you even. And the one thing we've been teaching people for all of that time is don't top trees. Yeah. Right. Um, we top crepe myrtle all the time. Crepe myrtle is a little easier to take it and it's a smaller tree. But as I was driving west last week to give a talk, the western part of the state, I am still aghast at how much topping I see in on. everybody's yards. We're talking big trees, yeah. you know, big diameter oaks that are 60 feet tall. Well, they're not anymore because we've cut them. So they look round and stuff. And I, and you, like you said, somebody sees that and they say, well, I want my trees to look like that or whatever. And, you know, the tree works against itself. It's very hard for a tree to die from bad pruning, right? It yeah. doesn't happen often. Plants no. just are tough, super yeah. tough, and they can tolerate that. That's a very good point. And that's part of the problem. Uh, you know, I, when I talk about pruning, I'm like, if that tree would just up and die after we did that, then we'd say, hmm, maybe we shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> I would hope we would, right? So, yeah, when you see, like, I still see that. And, in, in, you know, the problem is the people that we teach and we talk to are the ones coming to the meetings. The ones yeah, that are doing absolutely. much of that activity are probably not coming to the meeting. And it is an easier thing for somebody that doesn't know a lot about arbor culture and how to prune properly to do. And so, you know, make sure we beat this all the time. Make sure you're hiring somebody to do tree work for you that is a certified arborist or has one on the crew. Will you pay more? Absolutely. But would you not pay more to get a better doctor, a better dentist or, or whatever? So. This is a, being a, a professional in arbor culture is, is, a, is a professional field. We're yeah. not just a bunch of, you know, dudes out there cutting stuff, right? <laughs> we are more than that. And there's a lot of science behind pruning, yep. as, as you know, and how plants respond. And um, so you, you don't be afraid that you would kill a tree by improperly pruning it. And, you know, I still make incorrect cr cuts from time to time. Mm -hmm. We all do. You get hurried or whatever. You, you're trying to prune from the ground and you don't have an easy angle. So, um, but understand what your goal is. Always ask yourself, why am I pruning this plant? If it's, especially if you're taking off live material because you're going to affect how the plant grows. So understanding, you know, trees and shrubs are different. Shrubs are, you know, a little easier there, but, and why you're pruning them is easier, but why am I pruning this tree? And, and, and so, and there's a lot of great reasons, you know? Yeah. A view is a fine reason. If you live in the mountains and you want to be able to see through the valley, that's fine as long as you're doing it correctly. So, yeah, I still see way too much uh, and I, I don't know how to make it stop. <laughs> well, it's, it's all the things you said, you know, it's educating people. And, and I, whenever I do talks, I, you know, I look out in the audience and I was like, the things that I'm telling people to do, most of these people are doing that. Right. And the people that I need to tell aren't, aren't here, mm -hmm. but you can't make them come to these things. But, um, you know, all the things you said kind of kind of ring home, you know, having a goal, reasons to do it. Why, you know, is it because it's, it's gotten too big? Um, is it because it's not flowering? Is it because, you know, there lots of lots of things, you know, I think why most people top is they're afraid it's going to fall in their house. Right. And that's always a possibility. 
but in most cases, it's it's not. Um, when you, know, you top a big tree, you're potentially increasing the risk of something falling. Right, right. It's 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 depending on you know if you top it down to you know a 60 foot tree down to 10 feet, that tree's going to die. Yep. Or it's just going to okay. be a nice totem pole in your front yard. <laughs> um, but if you're up there rounding it off, lots of bad things. You know, the stress, the the growth that comes out is going to be weak and can rip and tear. And yep. And connected to decay. All yeah. all that stuff, yep. and it's going to be more likely to to do that. So. You know, it, it's an old, it's been going on forever. Mm -hmm. It's something that I talk about way too much. And I, I was, <laughs> I was just, I just came back from Texas and Louisiana and you know, it's, you ride by these beautiful houses with this oak tree, this big around that's 10 feet off the ground. Oh, they just, wow. you know, yeah. just completely destroyed it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, having goals, you know, starting and, you know, start small, take off little, little pieces and, and work that way. You can't put stuff back, but, um, <laughs> I, I think Bruce used to say, you know, a tree has never died from being, uh, pruned the wrong way. That is true. Um, and that's, that's, that should be on a t-shirt somewhere. <laughs> I'm we, sure there are, we could make them we, ourselves. We, we, Greg. we, we could, we, we could, could make millions that. making our own t-shirt yeah. slogans. That's what we, that's the retirement plan. There right you there. go. You just I like said it. it. I'm like off it. to do that now. I like it. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Um, where are we at time wise, Blake? <clears throat> it's 345. We've got about 15 minutes. If you'd like, I can give you guys some, some of the questions that have come yeah, out. I'm sure you'll yeah, be able let's, to let's discuss that. So Deborah asked, for those of us that live in HOA communities uh, and want to nurture a more native or productive environment, what organizations are there that can help us educate the community to make those changes? Well, Certainly, Extension is, uh, is a, a, an awesome resource and I think sometimes untapped. And why I say that is you have a county extension agent, you have someone like me who is a, a specialist uh, and, you know, cover the whole state. And there are folks that do fruit trees. I am, of course, landscapes that include trees, of course, is my special area of expertise. But I also know about other plants. But there are certainly different other departments, other folks that are interested in the kind of more the native plant communities that you're talking about that will come and give these presentations and provide that information to your HOAs. All you got to do is invite us, uh, you know, and you might not get us to leave. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, we'll come and, t and talk to you about the benefits of that, you know, and sometimes having that person from the 50 mile, you know, away is a better way to argue than somebody more local. And so, yeah, and working, you know, providing research based information is what the university is all about. Right. That's what we do in extension. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. How do you decide what's the best? Uh, that, that's always going to be my stance is what's research based. And so, you know, that's kind of where you can start providing some of that information to, uh, to your HOAs. HOAs are tough, I'll tell you, because, you know, they're, they're pretty hardcore sometimes and, and they get certain ideas and I'm not sure where those come from, but trying to, you know, again, check out uh, your extension websites. You can do that at NC State. Uh, obviously the Arboretum can be a great resource of providing information. And if somebody here might not go see you, they'll tell you who you could get to come talk to you. We're, uh, we're big, we're big promoters of, of extension and all things that, that, that it entails. Um, and we are very lucky to live in a state that has one of the best that I've ever worked with. Um, the only one that comes close, uh, no offense to any place I've lived, uh, Penn State has a great one too. Penn State does, yep. But um, NC State is second to none and they're all connected to each other. Yep. If they don't know, they know somebody that you knows. You know somebody that can help so, you. So, and that's that's the same thing with us. What we don't know, we're gonna send you in, in that direction in a, in a heartbeat. And a lot of people on HOAs just aren't educated and they have a way that they want to do something. <laughs> and everything that we do is, is, is science-based and, and has that behind it, so. That's, that's, that's really, really good advice. Awesome. So Carol had a question for Barb. She wanted to know if Barb, if you could talk about artillery fungus in mulch. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, I'm gonna disappoint you. What do you know? I, I mean, I know artillery fungus, you, you put it, once you get it, it shoots on the house. Um, yeah. You know, just getting good quality mulch, but, uh, you know, and making sure it doesn't stay too wet, I'd imagine. I am not 
uh, an expert on that kind of fungus. You want to it's, talk it's, about decay in trees? Sure, but not it's, that it's one. a question. Yeah, it's a question that I've been asked quite a, quite a bit. And Carol, Good. <laughs> if this is the same Carol, she may have talked to me about this already. <laughs> but um, and I told her to paint her house a dark color. That would, that would fix it. Um, it. I think I think the thing with that is is using fresh mulch, and um, you know. When you recharge your mulch, when you remulch your yard, it, it behooves you because, as Barb mentioned, it can get hydrophobic mm -hmm. and it can get it can form kind of a crust. So, if nothing else, I tell people take a hard rake, break that up so that it's broken down to your soil, and do a light covering of mulch, keeping mm -hmm. it within that three to four inches away from your root flares and the bases of your trees and shrubs. Don't cover your herbaceous stuff. I think that'll kind of keep it at bay. Mm -hmm. The other thing that ties into that that we get asked about, you know, there's the staghorn fungus that comes up, mm -hmm. um, and then there's the um, I don't know what the the, the term for it is. Uh, people tell me it looks like dog throw up. Yep. Um, dog the, vomit. Dog uh, vomit. Uh, dog vomit fungus. Fungus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are aesthetic things. They're not going to hurt anything. Right. The artillery fungus isn't going to hurt anything. It's going to stain your house. But, you know, they look like little cups. And when you see those getting formed, I think just breaking them up or covering yep. them up with, with fresh mulch is going to inhibit that. Um, the, the people that always ask me about the other ones, you know, if you don't like it, scoop it up and throw it someplace else in your garden or just, you know, move it around. It's, again, nature is dirty. It's, it's a natural process. Things are breaking down and those things are, are, are forming. Um, I went to somebody's house a couple of weeks ago. They, had, they said, I've got mushrooms growing up all through my yard. And I went to the yard and I said, did you have a nice big tree there? And they said, yes. <laughs> yep. And you could see the outlines of the roots that went out into the grass. And that fungus is just decaying those roots. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's killing my grass. Well, you know, I am not sympathetic to, to, to turf grass. <laughs> and I said, just get a shovel and break it loose. And, you know, it's going to come back. But right. in the short term, that's going to keep it from, from coming up and making your yard look look white. But, you know, it's, it's going to keep doing that till those that, that organic matter is gone. That's nature. Yep. Breaking mm -hmm. stuff down. Yep. For sure. And let, let's keep things in the theme of mulch. Vandy would like you to discuss the consequences of using bark and pine straw in large swaths as a ground cover rather than plants, let's say. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, per se. You know, it's just Barb Fair's opinion about the underwear of the landscape. You know, we do it everywhere. But to me, that's a boring landscape. You know, everybody says, oh, you have a big turf grass and you have a couple of trees. That's a boring landscape. I agree. But I also agree that a vast swath of, of mulch, what, whether it's pine straw or whether it's, you know, triple shredded hardwood or that red stuff that people sometimes like at the RBC Center, it seems. Uh, but point being, it, it's perfectly fine if you're doing it correctly and it's good quality mulch. But to me, it's not as diverse mm -mm. with regards to plants and animals as it could be. You think about a garden, you can have many gardens everywhere. And I'm not even talking about a bunch of plants and you can keep it simple, right? Uh, a tree where, you've, where you're putting in azaleas or something underneath it, a great understory shrub, doesn't have to be complicated, right? So lots of cool understory plants out there that you can put. It, it, to me, it's better certainly than turf grass um, to have mulch, uh, but um, there's nothing wrong with it. So please understand that was just that was just Barb Fair saying I don't dig all that mulch. I I, I, I feel the same. You know, some of the things that register with me are, you know, I wonder what the temperature if it's around your home. You know, it's going to make your house warmer because there's going to be some reflectivity and there's nothing to kind of break that up. Um, you know, going in a different direction, uh, talking about pine needles, um, you know, from a mulch perspective, it, it doesn't add as much organic matter. If you're thinking about planting uh, in this situation, it sounds like maybe, maybe not. But, you know, the whole diversity thing, there's just, it's just not that, just not that exciting to me. Um, you know, there's, it could be it could be better served um, using this question as a, an opportunity to talk about connecting things together with mulch um, and adding more mulch. That's a good thing because it gives tree roots more opportunity not to compete with grass and to go into those areas or to use more plants and link things together. So instead of having those individual islands, it's nice to kind of tie those things together because it does help the benefit of the tree by increasing uh, more more roots. 
Okay, those are the, all really great points. Now, here's, here's the best question of the day. <laughs> this is from Jared. He says, curious what y'all's opinions are for the worst trees that are overplanted in urban landscapes. Boy, we, do we have time let, for this? Let, yeah, right? <laughs> you know, and Greg knows me well. Anybody that's ever heard me talk is going to tell you red maple is certainly the first one on the top of my list. Mine too. It is overplanted. It, I don't know if y'all know, but its other common name is swamp maple for a very good reason. It lives in wet lowland areas. That's where it thrives. So we put it in hot parking lots with limited space. And the problem with that is it will not thrive. And that lack of thriving means it's going to get a little insect called gloomy scale. I'm gonna also add white, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna add willow oak to that list now as well. Uh, willow oak is way overplanted. There are so many species of oak out there that we are ignoring. And uh, you know, the site I was telling you about on Poland was all willow oak and they're doing terribly. And I'm seeing, I don't know what you're seeing, but I'm seeing a, lar a lot of large willow oak beginning to decline. Fail. Yeah. And I think part of it has to do with climate change. I think they are not uh, adapting as well as climate we change, would like them stress. to be. Drought stress, yeah. you know, over and over again. And again, they are also prone to a scale, lacanium scale, yep. because of stress. And Dr. Steve Frank has done a lot of research on those two species and the interaction with those insects. Can canker worm. And, and yeah, and it's all about heat. Uh, and, um, and so those are two on the top of my list. I don't like Zelkova anymore for a similar reason. <laughs> um, you know, of course, crepe myrtle, I get it. We've overplanted that everywhere. But oh, I'm going to tell you, it is very hard to find a small statured flowering, and especially if somebody wants native flowering tree, especially if you have a terrible soil site. Yep. That is tricky. And I get that question all the time. So those are my, those same, are my top. Same, <laughs> I, I, I like red maple as a tree. It's just Love not it. a good yes. urban tree. Right. It'll do well in a park where it's got room to kind of do its thing. Yep. Um, but for all those reasons and more, if you plant them too close to your house, they're inevitably gonna find your sewer line. <laughs> they're gonna, you know, I had a, I had a neighbor, uh, my sister-in-law had a neighbor in Charlotte that had one, the roots actually came up into the toilet of her lower bathroom. Oh wow, that'd be scary. Into her, yeah, it got <laughs> like into a, her, her sewer movie. line. So for <laughs> all those same reasons, uh, red maple, willow oak, it's a great oak, it's super tough, but it's, 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 there are so many other oaks that, that do just as well, that have bigger leaves, better fall color, nicer bark, smaller in stature, grow a little bit quicker, fastidiate ones, round crowns, there's a ton of oaks that, that do well. Um, you know, I like crepe myrtle because it, it has winter, spring, summer, fall interest. Um, you're gonna be hard pressed to find any tree that can, that can take the heat and the stress of urban situations that performs that well. Um, but because we have so many, again, if you build it, they will come. The crepe myrtle bark scale has become yep. a huge pest. I was driving back from the airport yesterday and just row after row of them, just black with the sooty mold, yep. just loaded with, with the scale. I get more questions about that than probably anything now by people in the garden and volunteers, what can I do? I'm, I'm tired of it. Um, you know, you can treat it, it's, it's not terribly hard to, to treat, but you know, it's the, the our, our hot, our climate changes, drought stress, all those things just make the trees stress out more susceptible to it. So th those are those are my, my, my top three. Zocova's sneaking in there too for the same reasons they start to fall apart. Um, people plant them too deep and the, the root systems just shut down and collapse and then they just kind of fall apart and, and disappear. Um, I hate Leyland cypress. Um, it's overplanted. <laughs> yeah. You plant them on berms. They dry out in, in droughts and start to fall apart. They plant them too close. They get ceridium cankers and, and other things. Um, there's a ton of other conifers that are just as hardworking. You know, luckily, as I mentioned, uh, there's lots of places you can go to see better examples come here. There's a lot of things that we're doing and are going to continue to do and add to the Arboretum. Um, I love going to the Art Museum. They've got some interesting things and choices that they've made for, for plants there. Um, you know, there, there are places to, to see, see good things that instead of some of those, those, those substitutes. And if you've got space, plant a Kentucky coffee tree. Those things are awesome. They're crazy, uh, scary kind of you know, Halloween trees they're when they're shapes. young and they're kind of ugly yeah. ducklings, but they have amazing bark and uh, big leaves. And there's a male, uh, you know, cultivar that you can plant so you don't have the big fruit pods. Yep. 
it's a gorgeous tree. Decent uh, you know, fall color. Yeah, decent fall color can have amazing fall color, and yep. it, you know, but you need some space. Uh, once that gets going, it's going to do well. Yeah, there's, so, there's lots of I other options. I thought I'd throw one, and it's native, right? <laughs> so, lots of other options. There are, and the key, and this is what we still fail to get, is diverse plantings, yeah. right? And I get, you know, you can have a street that has all the same species on it, but we don't have to do that. No. We can plant a diverse bunch of trees in that. We just have to change our, our aesthetic. And that's- It looks good on the, the landscape architectural part. rendering it to does. have all, the all same those same little circles, circles but you can, you can still achieve that with masses and using different using different different things there's lots of lots of options and planting trees closer together than we once used to think was good i want to see canopies kind of you know where the branches are touching each other because you think about how they grow in nature that's how they grow yeah. they help each other and it also helps slow down like on large maturing trees you're not going to get those really big branches right they're going to slow down growth their sun's a little limited and that's going to really help minimize yep. the amount of pruning you have to do as they get older and so and they protect each other from the wind exactly. and, and all that stuff. So plant them. They're like buddies. Plant them as buddies. Friends. They need plant friends. Plant them as group. They need friends. They need friends. Right? We all need more friends. They get lonely when they're by themselves. Yes. And bad things can happen. Yep. No yeah. kidding. Well, that is actually a great place to end this conversation awesome. okay. for today. So this, this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Barb, for stepping in and Thank covering you for, having for us. Me. No, this was truly wonderful. We are very grateful for you. I'm sure Alexander is going to make you that fudge that he talked about. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure he does that. It's, it's been said on camera, which means it has to happen. There it is. No kidding. I have a plant in mind, though, that I'm hoping somebody oh. can find for me that uh, I no might kidding. take home someday. So we'll, we'll have we can to help you with exchange that. rate between fudge and plant. We know some people. <laughs> we know some people. I figured. Okay. Well, well thank, thank you for you. having me. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. I appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining us today. We will be back next Wednesday at three o'clock for another wonderful rendition of the midweek program. We'll be doing the horticulture hour. So bring your questions. We will have answers for you. We will see you all then next week at three o'clock. Y'all take care.